Welcome back to the service bench, everyone. Today is going to be a little bit different. Don't have any vacuum tube equipment or TVs or radios. I kind of need to take a little break from that. I had a special request from a friend of a friend to see if I could work on a few antiques for them. I've done a number of different things for them in the past, but they had some uh, interesting, uh, interesting little pieces they wanted me to sort of get working again, that sort of thing. One of which is a vintage uh, exit sign. This one is actually milk glass. The one I had done previously was, I want to say it was probably blown plastic. It was a molded uh, plastic sign, very similar to this, had a, a conical shape to it, much thinner taper, and then a, a pretty typical uh, screw mount base. I really liked these. Tighten them. I feel like you break the uh, the neck off of these glass fixtures pretty easily. And plus the plating, the cheesy plating on this one is pretty well toast. So I'll probably wind up replacing this. Uh, the plan with this is actually to do the same thing I did to the other one, which is to convert it to LED battery operation. Uh, the previous one I put in an off-the-shelf uh, lithium-ion battery pack and a USB charging board. I think I got those from Adafruit, if I remember right. Pretty cheap. And I set up a push-button system on it for uh, toggling on and off. I actually wound up making a very tiny uh, latching relay circuit, basically a D flip-flop, uh, to make it work. It turned out really good, but I did not have a lot of space in the base. This one actually is quite a bit bigger. One of the issues I am seeing, actually it's the same issue I had with the other one, is that the mounting screws are in the bottom here and uh, my electronics have to go in this area, the LEDs have to go through the center, and I have to make sure that I stay away from those because I used a backing plate over this uh, to cover everything up and to give the electronics somewhere to mount to, and I had to put pass-through holes for these mounting screws as well as points to mount everything else. It was yeah, it was a little tricky, but I got it to work. Uh, I'm probably going to look into just finding a better condition base for this, because this base isn't anything special. This is a pretty typical light fixture base. However, the point of this video is not to look at this. I'm going to do that later, because I still have to order stuff for it. What I want to look at is the other thing they sent me, and that is this little guy. I've seen plenty of these in all sorts of antique shops and... You know, classic movies and that sort of thing. And it's a Kit Kat clock. And as a matter of this is a, a proper original Kit Kat clock. I just want a moment to take a look at the box. Although, uh, interestingly, they actually use an equal sign. I don't know if they're telling you that it's this. It, I don't know what the deal there is. I've seen. Um, I wonder if maybe this is a, a, a copycat, pun intended. Either way. This is a real one. It's got the luminous eyes, which is interesting. There's no light in here. I have to wonder if maybe this was actually supposed to be a glow-in-the-dark plastic. Um, apparently the mouth and dial are also luminous. Because if they are plastic, it wouldn't be radium or anything like you'd find with paint. I believe, just looking at the construction, this is probably one that was made in the 60s. And unlike the ones I typically see which are black, this is actually red. Now there are a few grievances that we need to address with this little guy. First and foremost, the hands are uh, toast. There's only one present, the other one broke off. Plastic tends to get brittle. Uh, the plastic on the mouth has turned yellow a little bit, unlike the numbers and everything. On the front, which are actually in pretty good shape, uh, eyes are okay. Does not have a tail. Uh, mercifully, there is a company that specializes in spare parts for Kit Kat clocks, both new and old, and both the hands and a variety of tails are available, so I'll be able to pick those up very cheap. However, the other bigger issue is it does not run. And this little guy, like a lot of clocks from the period, relies on a synchron, synchronous, self-starting electric motor. And I actually have one in an Admiral Radio and Television uh, sign, probably from the, well, probably from the same period. 
and that one has the same issue. It will not run. The coil seems to be good, but the motor itself will not actually spin up and start moving. And I don't have a lot of prior experience with these, but we'll go ahead and we'll get inside him real quick. Uh, interesting construction. There are no screws on these, yet the mounting hole up here, the ears up here, there are two tabs that actually hook into that, and you have to push down on the tab at the bottom very carefully to get it to unlatch, and then that just comes off. It's a little warped. I'm not too worried about that. And then we can see we have our line cord coming in and a pretty typical Synchron motor. Um, the other thing that I discovered is that uh, Synchron motors, thankfully, are... There's a lot of different varieties, but there's also a lot of modern-made replacements. So if this one is bad, if I can't get it to operate, I'm not totally uh, SOL. I might actually be able to get a drop-in replacement, although some of the things I have read show that the gears that the Synchron replacement motors typically come with may not be exactly the right size. There may be a little hand-fitting I have to do, but that remains to be seen. I have plugged this in. The motor does hum a little bit. It does not want to fire up, though. What I want to see is if it's just a matter of getting it clean and lubricated to get it working right, because honestly, I think that's the main problem with a lot of these. So I'm going to put down some sort of a soft cloth here because I don't want to set the clock down on this table that's had solder and all sorts of other spatter on it. Being a uh, licensed Philco dealer has its perks. You get all these really neat uh, special bits for your service bench. Okay, so I'm going to get this motor out and take a look and see what the drive mechanism looked like. Quick. And I'm not sure about replacing the cord because it's a very thin insulation and although normally my uh, gut instinct would be to replace it, uh, the clock is worth more in more original condition and being as this is the original cord and hey look the original strain relief is still hard as a rock and all the way down here. That I can at least replace because that just slips into the slot and I can undo the wire nut and the knot there and um, get that swapped out. But the cord itself is still relatively flexible. I'll probably leave that alone. It's not hurting anything. And this does not draw a whole lot of power, obviously. So it looks like we just have those two small screws. And then it doesn't really want to lift out. Okay. Well, we might have to go a little bit deeper here. Let's see, it looks like the majority of the mechanism is going to... Oh wait, before I do that, we're actually going to need to remove the hands. So those are going to be captive. These are supposed to be... Yep, these are just a press fit. Looks like it's probably the hours... The hours hand or the minutes hand? Eh, that might be the minute hand. Is the, uh, the ring and then the tip is the hours. Ours is pretty well gone. This plastic does look like it might glow in the dark. I'll have to try it in my uh, one of my lamps and see if it does later. The eyes too, maybe. I gotta be honest, I've always found these things creepy. I know they were probably really neat and cute at the time they were designed, but the same thing with clowns from the 50s, it's just... I don't know. It's bizarre, I think it's weird. But they are extremely collectible and extremely sought after to the point where there's plenty of battery-operated reproductions but the real thing still brings plenty of money at auction. Okay, and then that should slip out of the eyes, and he's going to go a little bit cross-eyed here. Oh, yes. Wonderful. All right, we'll set the body aside for now. I do want to do a light cleaning on it, but nothing too crazy. No alcohol or anything, because I'm not sure how it might react. Uh, okay, so what I'm seeing is that the entire gear train is made out of plastic. Uh, that's fun, but there's no stripped gear teeth. I'm not under a lot of strain or anything, but I am going to have to take that apart to get the motor untrapped. And it looks like there are another four small screws doing that, and I'm going to try and do my best to not let this whole thing just fall to pieces 
because I don't think there are any diagrams out there that show the orientation of all these gears, and it would just be my luck to have them go all over the place. Yeah. So, the gear train is just held in place by gravity, and we've got those pins there, so if I spin this guy... What exactly triggers the eye and tail motion? Because the eyes and tail are um, geared to the same place. Okay, so we've got one part of the cam that triggers that. Huh. I'm not exactly seeing what's supposed to make the assembly here wag there's no stud or anything for it to connect to either way oh okay so the drive gear here if i take the backing plate off the backing the the gear the drive gear actually has this little fella this little nub right here and that's going to engage with this slot and the eyepiece, and that's going to drive everything, including that. I'll probably wipe all these parts down. They look a little gross. Just clean all that up while I'm in there. Uh, but I suppose what I can do is just plug this in for a moment and see if this pinion spins. I don't think it does. I've watched it. Or at least my initial reaction was that it didn't seem to do much of anything. And, big surprise, we've got a whole lot of nothing going on. So that should be spinning at a decent rate in order for the eyes and mouth to move. Hmm. One of the issues I have with these Synchron motors is the one that I attempted to take apart with my other clock is that they're, uh, they have a fairly sealed construction. I get the feeling that no one thought they would ever really need any kind of maintenance. Um, hmm. Kind of curious what this little bar right here is for. It looks like it ought to come off the back. I mean, what's the harm in just uh, popping that loose? So there's a little piece of plastic pressing down on the motor spindle right there. The other thing I don't really know is there are lubrication points. There's one right there. There's one right here. And then it looks like evidence of some kind of something having been in that at one point. I wonder if maybe I can use a little bit of deoxid to get in there and try to uh, break this free. And deoxid is electrically safe. It doesn't leave any kind of conductive residue behind. Because if I can avoid buying a new motor and passing the cost on to the customer, I will. But if this is not an effective fix, then I might just have to go that route. And the motors aren't too bad. They're under 100 bucks. But again, save money where you can. If you can save original parts, I like to save original parts. And I'm just going to hit this off camera here. One thing I am going to do is, if I can find a small enough implement, I'm going to give the rotor, or the, the stub on the back of the motor here, I'm going to give it a light twist to see. Ah, yeah, that feels a little gooey, at least to me. That might be residual magnetism, but it, it doesn't feel all that smooth. And it is driving the mechanism. Now I've moved it a little. Let's see if the motor will kickstart itself. Because this is supposed to be a self-starting motor, it doesn't need any help to get going. Let's see. Well, that was a lie. 
I can I can definitely feel it, you know, vibrating a little bit. But uh, we're not getting much more than that. The other motor I had access to, um, the flywheel was actually accessible and I could lightly spin it with my finger. I can't really do that on this. Okay. So that's still not wanting to go. How can I get in there? Is there any way to get in there? I think that little spring piece on the back was supposed to be sort of a... I don't know, maybe it's just there to, to slow. Is it When it starts to spin up, the spindle wants to come out. Maybe it's just to keep it pressed forward so that it doesn't move around so much. Hmm. Fortunately, all I can do is speculate because I have no way to get in there. This is all pressed assembly, which I'm sure was a cheap way of manufacturing these. It does not make them very easily uh, serviceable, unfortunately. Ah, crud. Apologies there. Got the oxit running down my hands. Just trying to figure out how I could... Oh! Hey, I just started working. Okay, well, that's good news. So it is running on its side. And it will run upside down. So that was the thing. It's been sitting for so long with no lubrication that whatever lubrication what is in there tends to turn into varnish. And with something like this that has practically no torque, it's not going to be able to overcome it. However, if I can get a little bit of something in there to, to break it free, and then get it to fire up on its own, well then, hey. There we go. The question is, though, obviously the motor itself, the main drive shaft, is going to need some amount of lubrication, because this should go straight through to the bottom into here. Hmm... I really wish I could put this in my ultrasonic cleaner and run it with some sort of a uh, degreasing agent. Unfortunately, the windings for the coil in the motor um, would not agree with that operation very well. So, that's already good. I think... I want to let it run for a little bit, see how warm it gets. One people, thing people have noted is that uh, you want to see if it's going to generate a lot of heat, if it's got a lot of... Um, Mechanical resistance, it may get fairly warm. And I also want to give the time uh, time for the deoxid to uh, dry out. Because once it's done that, I'll need to go back in there with some sort of a very, very light, like a sewing machine oil. I'll need to double check what the proper lubricant for a mechanism like this is, but I'm sure it's an extremely light oil. And you generally don't want a ton of it on... Uh, watch movements. That may only be for mechanical uh, watch and clock movements. But either way, we have that running. I'm going to leave it alone for a little bit, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give it about an hour or so and see how it does. In the meantime, I'm going to go online, and I'm going to buy some replacement hands and a new tail for this little guy, and then we'll take a look at cleaning up this mechanism a little bit, and then getting them back together. Okay, now where did I leave off? I think last we were looking at this, I was letting uh, the motor assembly here just sort of run for a while, and that has been pretty successful. In fact, if I try it again now, fires right back up and starts spinning. No problem, doesn't make any weird noises, so that is good to go. And my hands and replacement tail have arrived. However, we have a bit of a dilemma here. So, the original hands and eyes on this clock, and according to the, um, the, the uh, box here, it says the eyes, mouth, and dial all light up. So, in this case, they mean the hands. The numbers themselves do not appear to be luminous. 
Uh, it looks like standard just white paint like the uh, imprinting on the uh, paws and everywhere else. But I might be wrong. I'll have to test it out. Unfortunately, uh, only the hour hand is intact for the glow. The minute hand was broken off at the base, and sadly I could not get a glow-in-the-dark minute hand. So I just ordered a pair of replacement hands from the KitKat uh, clock supplier that they mostly deal with the newer battery-operated ones, but they do have some parts for the original ones. But they're not new old stock. They're just sort of I'm sure they're I'm sure they're pulled off of uh, broken or damaged units. So I have these two. One of them's kind of a this one's fairly new looking and it's just general white. That's fine. This one here is kind of an ugly beige-ish color. I'm not sure if this is discolored or if this is just the natural color of the plastic that they chose. Either way, it's it's more of a tan than white. So I talked to the owner about it. We're just gonna go with uh, painting this one white. I may paint both of them so that they don't they match. I don't want there to be a ton of variants. And of course the tail, which is just a very thin piece of plastic, they only had pink. Um, pink was the closest thing to red that I could get. So I have some Rust-Oleum Safety Red and I'm going to test and see whether this is close enough to the body color of the clock. I'm hoping it is anyway. Uh, yeah, this is a, the body color of the clock is a fairly bright red. And the Rust-Oleum red is, well, well, we'll see. I'll spray it, and there's a million different types of red paint out there. And we'll see how that goes. Either way. So I need to, because plastic is a very smooth surface, I'm going to need to scuff this with some sandpaper. Um, I was... I'm probably just going to primer it. I don't have any of the paint and primer in one for the red. I do have paint and primer in one for the white. So I'm going to use Rust-Oleum uh, primer on this and then give it two or three coats of the red just to see how it comes out and then we'll match it to the body and see how it looks. Uh, so what I will do is I'm going to get most of this out of the way. I also need to clean up the gear set. So it's just a little, it's a little icky. Um, there is some stickiness on there. It's not really affecting the performance of the gear train, but I just want to clean all of it up before I put it all back together, just for peace of mind. So I'm going to go prep these for paint. Uh, probably do the same for these. I'm not sure if I really want to bother doing both sides necessarily, because you're only going to be seeing the outer surface. I just want to make sure both the, the top and sides are color matched. So we'll... We'll see how that goes, and I will set up a little painting area here. Okay, I got the mechanism cleaned up with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. Got all the little bits of grime and everything off it. I've remounted the motor and got all the other little pieces back in place, but before I go any further, I want to make sure that everything works before we stick it back inside the body of the clock. So this should fire right up, and there we go. I verify that the gear train isn't binding anywhere. Shouldn't be. Looks to be doing all right to me. Of course, I'm not going to sit here and wait for it to spin around a full minute or anything like that. But that looks pretty good. So we will get the body of the clock ready to put that back in because I got the painting done on the other parts. So we can reassemble this little guy. Uh, there is one little thing that I did want to deal with before we do that, however, and that is the grommet that went on the original power cable is hard as a rock. I want to undo the, the uh, nuts there and take the cord off. And I'm going to see if I have, in my assortment here, a reasonably correct sized grommet here. I think I do. Hmm. Diameter on that's a little small. Let's go up a size. Yeah, that's more appropriate. That's, I think it's a 3 8 the 244 thousandth inch inter uh, internal diameter. 
I just have one of those super generic ones you get off of, uh, actually I think I got this from Harbor Freight. Say what you will about them, occasionally there's some things that's handy to just have some cheap spares. And I use O-rings in a number of places. These are, these are great for putting on radio chassis for, uh, passing the cord through so that it doesn't, doesn't cut in there. So this isn't anything too special. They're not soldered or anything like that. Now some might be wondering why I'm doing, I even bother filming anything like this. Uh, to be honest, there's a lot of little things that I've thought about filming that aren't necessarily radio related or just little basic projects. And honestly, I just kind of want to share the, the fun of rebuilding things. A lot of folks might not realize how easy it is to just make something work again without a ton of effort. And I really think just seeing how easy it is to do some of this stuff might encourage other folks my age or no matter what age you are, just give it a shot, you know. I mean, granted, if you're going to start repairing stuff, you probably don't want to work on, like, super collectible items. I want to start a little bit more simple, but, uh, should not be afraid to just try making something work. Because the easiest way to figure out how something works is to take it apart, promptly break it, and then have to search online about how to fix it. Or just sort of noodle through it the hard way, which I wind up doing fairly often. Okay. Hopefully I put the little knot in the end of the cord back in the right place. If not, I'll have to tuck a little bit of this inside the cabinet. Oh, another thing I mentioned earlier in the uh, video that I wasn't quite sure why it was spelled Kit Kat in that fashion. Well, forgive my ignorance, I was thinking of the candy bar. When I thought about it, and uh, second, it's based off of a cartoon character. Now, what I'm not sure of is if uh, Kit Kat was the inspiration for Felix, or if that was the, they changed his name to it. I'm not familiar. The comic is very old, so I think that's good. Let's just verify the electrical connections I made aren't... Okay, we're good there. Our new grommet is on, and I am going to get this back into the cabinet so that we can get the hands and tail back onto it. Okay. Now the screws that are going into the plastic here, you readjust the camera, these are self-tapping from the look of things, they did not bother threading them. There's a little bit of dust in there, probably from they were inserted the first time. So I don't want to crank down on these too hard for risk of stripping it out and basically uh, being up shit creek without a paddle. So that should drop the little hole in the middle there. And then we should be able to drop these through. Just want the screws to touch the surface of the mechanism mount. Don't really need to crank down on them. So it's not going to fly apart. Yeah, just a little bit of tension. mount in the correct position. I believe I did. And I'm not fully seeing what keeps the tail on that. Huh. So, for reference, let me grab the tail here for a moment. That's gonna sit right about there, but then... What exactly is keeping it there? Oh. Oh, you pull down on it a little bit and it engages. Okay. Okay. 
And it looks like the tail may have come out a tad bit brighter than the overall body of the clock. I wasn't sure how that was going to work out. Might just be the lighting in here is... Yeah, it's a little bit brighter. Now, we just gotta guide our new bushing here, our little grommet. And we gotta get the wiring away from the rest of the mechanism, because I don't need it screwing up and touching the eyes. So that should press right in there, nice and tight. Okay. And then this... Okay, yeah, uh, this tab at the back here should actually trap the tail inside as well. So I'm going to temporarily attach the tail. Get that. On there. And then this just pokes up inside the ears. Trying to be as gentle as I can. This plastic is somewhat flexible, but not super flexible. <laughs> Come on now. This side does not want to play ball. Something's not quite right. I need to bring that back up and off. Oh, I think the power cord is getting in the way. Let's see. Is this I'm trying to get a better angle on it? Okay, so it's just a little bit warped from age, but I don't think that looks so bad. I don't know how it looks on camera, but in terms of... Oh, let me hold him a little sideways there. To me, the, uh, the, the tail is a little bit brighter, but, um, I mean, it's not too bad, I don't think. It does look like he could use a little bit of cleaning here, but I am hesitant to use alcohol anywhere near this. Might try just around the middle here where the hands are really quickly, just to get that just a little bit clean. I'm pretty sure the numbers on there are probably an enamel of some sort and would not, not respond all that kindly to something like this. Yeah, there's a little bit of dirt on there. Okay, we'll use the dry side to get any streaks. Okay. And then we have the new hands that I've added, or painted, I should say. And these little fellas are just going to Carefully press on there. Just like that. And that look too bad. I'm going to set them up and make sure everything works and then run it for a few hours and make sure that it is. Oh, uh, uh, the Synchron motor should still be able to keep pretty good time. So. Just need to figure out a good way to hang him. I might be able to put a screw in the top of my workbench here. Uh, I will be right back. Okay, for the uh, sake of honesty here, had a bit of a mishap trying to hang the clock up. The screw that I was trying to use had a head that was ever so slightly too big for the little hole in the back of the clock's base. So, of course, I slipped it over there and went to pull it down slightly to engage it in the little notch that's in the back. It just slipped clean off the head and jammed the tail of the clock against the counter. And when it did that, it managed to snap the piece of plastic that the tail attaches to in the mechanism clean in half. And I am currently working on repairing it putting it back into 
one piece, hopefully. Thankfully, it's not an exceptionally load-bearing part and having to glue it together. And I'll probably, I'm using Gorilla Glue at the moment to hold the two pieces together and clamping it. After I've done that, um, I will probably take it to work with me and use a bit of a two-part epoxy on the outside to completely cover the split and ensure that it does not have the opportunity to come apart again. And since it's inside, you won't see the repair. But, um... Uh, yeah. I probably should have known better. I'm never gonna get it out of any of these things super easy. But, yeah, I figured it's important to not... not skip over stuff like this. When you do repairs on antiques, or on just about anything, there's, you probably will screw up. It happens to everyone, no matter how good you are, or amateur you are, you're gonna break something at some point. But, an important thing is, knowing how to repair it, getting it back together, and moving on with our lives. So, that's what I'm gonna do, and unfortunately that means I'm not gonna be able to complete it today. Okay, so the previous attempt to repair the tail on the KitKat clock was a little bit, it wasn't disastrous, it just outright failed. So I attempted to use uh, Gorilla Glue to reattach those two pieces of, I'm not quite sure what type of early plastic they were. Um, unfortunately, even though I, I got enough, a decent amount of glue in between the two components, I tried to cover the surfaces on the outside so there wasn't any exposed plastic that wasn't being bonded back to itself in the right spots. Uh, even after a 24-hour curing period, it just flat out did not hold at all. It was too flexible, and it just broke apart. Uh, thankfully, though, it was probably a good thing that it failed because it uh, gave me a chance to look at it again, and I realized that when I tried gluing them together and clamping them in my vise with the rubber jaws, it had actually twisted or knocked the two pieces out of alignment. And so when I went to put the piece back in the mechanism, the tail was actually uh, rotated at a slight angle and a drag on the plastic uh, back of the housing here. So I'm going to lift the little guy back up here. You can see the tail just sort of juts out through that slot. And it, the back of it kind of rides on this. There's there's really not much more than gravity just holding this thing on that, that little... It's not really a dovetail, it's just a triangular uh, mount. Uh, either way... Uh, my solution was to just use a two-part epoxy that we commonly use at work. And if you've ever wondered where this crap looks like hardened, there's a bit of it right there. And yeah, this stuff turns into a rock. Once this stuff hardens, you're not getting it off a surface. Definitely don't get it on yourself. It is a, uh, it's not like JB Weld necessarily. It's not a sandable material. It's, it's a very, very hard hard glue and uh, it works it works great put it in between the two cracked pieces covered the ex uh, external surfaces and the whole thing hardened up rock solid and I made damn sure this time to, to make sure the alignment was correct on those parts before I allowed it to set fully because once you set it fully I would have had to have used a hacksaw to take it apart uh, anyway got the hands back on um, I might still do a little bit of cleanup. The top of the, the top of them is just a little bit nasty. Um, hold on a moment. Let me get some isopropyl alcohol. There's a few spots in here where the plastic's just kind of gone a little bit cloudy. Let's see if that's dirt or... Yeah, well, my intention wasn't to make him shiny and bright, mostly just to get him working again. And so to that end, we will reattach the tail, which, in order to do that, you stick it under here, and you eyeball it, find the little plastic piece and it's gently pulled down and it 
magically locks into place. And the second time from the top where I don't drop the thing, I snug it down on that screw that I've got there. Okay. Can I get you in frame? Perfect. Now it should just be as easy as doing that. All in all, I'm pretty happy with the way that turned out. The hands look pretty decent. I was able to get paint coverage around all three sides. I did not do the bottoms. Um, I really didn't see any point in doing that. And plus, getting paint on the inside surfaces where they engage with the shaft would have made it more difficult to get them on and off if you ever have to take it apart again. So that being said, I'm going to let this little guy run for a little bit uh, and make sure everything works out. And I'll let the eyes soak up a little bit of light because they should still glow in the dark. Or at least I assume they will. But that about does it for this one. I've got another video I need to finish working on involving a relatively rare early 50s television. Uh, it's nothing too special electrically, but it isn't something you come across every day. And I've got a whole bunch of other projects that I'm trying to work on simultaneously. So this was just a, a quick and easy thing. And I, I'm not sure if I'm going to do a video on uh, this. Is that even in frame? I hate not having the back. Yeah. Uh, this exit sign here. I'm going to make this battery operated. There's really not much to it. I'm just going to put a, a battery on the inside of a mount. I'm going to replace this with a new one that doesn't look as junky. So I'll probably skip that because doing a video in addition to doing the work tends to make it take twice as long. And I'm sure the owner would like to have these back in a relatively decent time frame. I know I would too because the bench is getting a little bit cluttered. But I think that'll do it for this one. Um, so looking forward to showing off the new TV. And uh, hope to see you all there. Thanks for watching.